I'll have to keep my eye on the bottom there to see, make sure I'm still in, in voice. Uh, this is a first time experiment. Uh, SLAS has never done a Zoom meeting before. And so I want you all to cut us, and particularly me, a little slack if I'm a little slow or don't quite understand how things are working or should be working. Um, the other thing is, uh, I'm, we're going to have a converse, I'm going to have a conversation with Professor Einstein to start. And I have always encouraged you to have questions, and I want you to have questions, but please save your questions until the end. How I call upon you to uh, ask your questions, that's something we're going to learn when that happens. But my conversation with Professor Einstein will go on for maybe 20 minutes to 30 minutes. We'll just see how that, oh, we've got another person wanting to come in. Okay, uh, get him in. Uh, however, Luke Mo Moses is our co-host and he's the president of SLAS this year. He wants to say a few words and so I'm going to, if I can find him in the gallery, so I'll just, I'll just take it over here. Thank you. Um, so there's not too much business to talk about. We're going to talk about a little bit just at the beginning of this so that we can get it out of the way. Um, at our last board meeting, we kind of talked about how we want to proceed with reopening things and when we want to do that. We kind of discussed that once the state goes to a yellow status, uh, we would begin the conversation of how to proceed. Uh, I believe that that happened last week that the state went to a yellow status and uh, Roger mentioned to me that he was going to begin training operators for Spock. That doesn't mean we're starting Spock star parties, that doesn't mean we're beginning anything public yet, but the idea is to get members trained so that members can use our equipment. Uh, beyond that, I think we're still kind of in a holding pattern to decide how we move forwards. Uh, does anybody have any questions about the, um, our planned process or anything like that? And if you're raising your hand on your video, I can't see everybody on my screen, so I may not see you. I can see you, Roger. Okay, uh, what Luke says is correct, and I'm hoping to send out a notice uh, in the next 24 hours to the operators and the coordinators over each telescope for the uh, instruction. And next week, we're hoping to get the training out of the way so that when we start star parties, we will have a staff of trained operators. Yeah, and it, it's probably going to be a limited basis at first, but we will be proceeding with that training here soon. Um, are there any other questions about what we are doing for SLAS and how we're proceeding in light of COVID and all that jazz? You can feel free to send me chats or... Um, I believe in the bottom right corner, there's a couple dots that you can use to raise your hand. Um, hearing none or seeing none, I will hand it over to Joan and our guest professor. Okay, thank you. A few years ago, uh, SLAS went out through cyberspace and crossed the space-time continuum to contact Isaac Newton. The people who attended that meeting thoroughly enjoyed uh, that evening. With the health situation right now, it came, uh, it was suggested that we might try something like that again. And so we're going to reach across cyberspace. We actually have already done that because he's online. Uh, but we reached out this time to Professor Albert Einstein. Uh, so I need to find Professor Einstein on my gallery. There he is. And I'm going to spotlight him. 
thank you, Professor Einstein, for making your time available to us tonight. Uh, I would like to, it's my pleasure to be here. <laughs> I would like to uh, uh, expen, explain to you that the people who are participating tonight are amateur astronomers. And we're, and we're looking forward to having a good conversation with you. Uh, for your information, we have reached out and we are in the 21st century. <laughs> yes, so there will be, be something available for you to discuss, perhaps later on. You mean there is some sort of contagion in the 21st century? I thought you were speaking of the Spanish flu. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's get started. Uh, Professor Einstein, could you tell us a little bit about your early years? where you were born, lived, your education and interests? <laughs> well, uh, to begin, you start immediately to tax my memory. So, oh dear, let's see what we shall do. Well, of course, I was born in the town of Ulm, Germany in 1879. So, uh, there my sister and I were <clears throat> raised in rather comfortable circumstances uh, where education was of the utmost importance. Uh, also, I'm sure many of you are aware of my issues with schooling, but Perhaps, if you will indulge me, it would be better to address the influences that of uh, broader influences rather than ones to, to dwell on dates and, and places. So suffice to say that my childhood was much, was one such where I could explore and how shall I say, I was afforded the opportunity to wonder and the mysteries of the universe. And furthermore, have the capacity to fulfill these curiosities. So I recall one episode where my father gave me a simple pocket compass and I was awestruck by this. For no matter in what direction you turn the compass, the needle would always point north. And this led me to believe that there was something deeply hidden in nature that I was there to uncover. So I simply never lost my childlike curiosity, my secret was. I have always been in the child. I ask the simplest questions, and I ask them still. You make it sound so elementary, Professor. From what I know about your work, uh, The Fruits of Your Miracle Year, 1905, that wasn't so simplistic. <laughs> well, those were exciting times indeed. I sprang onto the stage like an ingenue, so to speak. Of course, there was a paper on Brownian motion that helped to prove the existence of atoms at a time when there was many people who did not believe atoms even existed. It is very difficult to prove the existence of something that is invisible, yeah? <laughs> and of course, there was the paper on the photoelectric effect as well. And for that, I was uh, awarded the Nobel Prize, uh, as though some of you may know. It was 15 years later in the offing. Yes. Uh, before we go uh, on uh, for that, I'd like to go back a little to your childhood fantasies. I read somewhere that you always wondered what it would be like to ride on a beam of light. Uh, that seems to be, to be another simple question that uh, brought about a gr maybe opened a great many doors to you later on. Could you elaborate on that? Yes, the topic of light, that's the essential tool of astronomers, yes? So perhaps I should focus on this uh, aspect of my works in, in, in 1905. So you see, there was uh, central to the theory of relativity in 1905, but the immutable characteristics of light itself. Specifically, it was the focus of relativity. And the essential component of this was that the speed of light was constant for all observers and relativity sets this in stone you see even at the expense of alterations in space and time and other dimensions now in my final paper in 1905 i went on to state that that speed that very special velocity was inextricably tied to both mass and energy and for this is the equation that i am all too very famous for today well c stands for celeritas, which is the Latin word for swift, like an arrow. So, as you well know, the speed of light travels 300 million meters per second, 
it is a very large number, and that is the reason why this equation is so very powerful. The mass energy equivalence principle, thanks to the work of brilliant minds like Curie and Bohr and Meitner, unlocked the workings of the invisible atoms and told us how the stars burn in the sky and give us the very same light that comes to the telescope of the astronomers across vast expanses of the universe. It is wonderful. That's the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. Don't you agree? Well, I suppose thanks to you, uh, for a large part thanks to you, can you explain the major differences between your 1905 work on special relativity and the subsequent general theory of relativity that you published 10 years later? That was important to astronomers like us. Go ahead. Uh, certainly, but <laughs> the major difference, uh, to be perfectly honest, was simply uh, the mathematics of it all. <laughs> Gott in Himmel, compared to the general theory, the mathematics of the first theory of relativity were mere child's play. Were well, it not for my long-term friend and accomplished mathematician, Marcel Grossman, I would never have succeeded. When we were at university, so I, I tended to skip class uh, with great regularity to hike and have sausages and drink coffee at the cafe, and Marcel would rescue me by showing me his mathematic notes. And then, 10 years later, he saved me again. <laughs> now, never before in my life had I been so troubled to such a degree. Even this puzzle, however, has a very simple question underlying it. And this is one that stargazers such as yourself will appreciate. I remember once from my studies that Plato said that astronomy is the science that compels us to look for the soul by looking upward and thus leads us from one world to another. And when I was a student in the world of physics was was crafted by none other than Isaac Newton. His law of universal gravitation was spectacularly successful for 500 years, uh, explaining the motions of falling apples, of orbiting moons, tides, and comets. His theories even predicted the existence of new planets. Isaac Newton sat triumphantly on his pedestal, seemingly unassailable. But forgive me, Newton. His theory did not explain everything in the world. And for my entire life, I was not afraid to question authority. And in the second half of the 19th century, astronomers discovered a small anomaly in the orbit of the planet Mercury. It was small, but it was still noticeable, and it could not be explained by Newtonian gravitation. Some predicted there was the presence of an un yet unseen planet this in the orbit of Mercury, they would even named it Vulcan, but it was not there. I have always believed that such irksome anomalies, which are so troublesome to others and so easily swept under the carpet, are actually very fertile fields for thought. And we know that this was the case with Michelson and Morley, with their attempt to measure the ether drift. And this experiment failed and was thought to be a great disaster, but to me, it led to special relativity. So perhaps the anomaly in the orbit of Mercury, the precession of Mercury, would be a flaw in Newtonian gravitation. And this idea consumed me for many years. It, it became a mere daydream. I remember one afternoon as I sat at the patent desk in Bern, I had the happiest thought of my life. It occurred to me that when a man falls from the roof, he feels no gravity. A man falling from a roof doesn't sound like it's a happy occurrence, Professor. <laughs> it, is, it is merely a thought experiment, so do, do not worry. Now, let me explain. When one is in free fall, he does not feel the force of gravity. The experience is what we call weightlessness. Yet, nonetheless, he is falling due to gravitation. So this sense of falling, it's precisely what an astronaut would feel if he were deep in space, far from the pool of a, the planet or, or the a sun, and he would float in his ship without feeling any weight at all. In both instances, the man feels the same thing. But the situations are very different. So 
Let us change the situation once again. If the space traveler was accelerated upward, he would then feel his weight again. Even though he was not near a planet or a sun, something that would provide gravity. Acceleration feels like gravity, and gravity feels like acceleration. Maybe they are one and the same, no? This is called the principle of equivalence. What Newton thought of as a force reaching between masses in space, I saw as a warping of the Minkowski space-time continuum. When an apple falls to Earth, it is merely responding to the surrounding four-dimensional topography. Four-dimensional topography? So, that doesn't sound like the museums of a child, Professor. Well, perhaps I am being a little obtuse. I apologize. Let me explain again. Suppose there is a small child and he is eating his favorite candy, jelly beans. He spends his entire allowance on them and decides in his delight to scatter them all over his bed and to lie in them the way a miser would lay in a pile of coins. So when the boy makes a depression in his mattress, would not the candies roll inward and collect around him? The child might presume that there is an attractive force between his favorite candy and himself. And if the boy was very smart, he could even derive equations and relationships that accurately describe this phenomenon of jelly bean attraction. Now, alas, this is not a true representation of reality. The candies are just responding to the warping of the bed caused by the mass of the boy. Simple. But alas, a charming theory on paper, no matter how elegant, is not enough to unseat the master Newton. There must be experimental proof. So how does one prove such a thing? Appropriately, with the help of astronomers. Excuse me, just a moment, Professor. May I offer you a cup of refreshment? Oh, absolutely, thank you. Yes. Don't push in. <laughs> I'm sure we'd like to, my, everyone in attendance would like to hear more. Please go on. No. In 1913, I wrote that the uh, eminent American astronomer, George Ellery Hale uh, of the renowned Mount Wilson Observatory in California. And I asked him if it would be possible to detect the curvature of space around a very massive body like the sun. Now, my youthful infatuation with light would also figure in this experiment for a beam of light from a different star would be our jelly bean, if you will. If the beam of light was seen to bend as it passed by the sun, it would prove that the light was responding to the curved space caused by its immense mass. And you'll see, unlike a jelly bean or an apple or the moon, the mass of light is zero. And thus, Newton's equations fail. There needs to be two masses, as all of you know who have taken a class in physics. So this would not work. How did uh, astronomers help you uh, confirm that, since viewing stars is not available during the day? A very elementary question. So unless you could somehow darken the sun, yes, and eclipse. Now, Hell responded that this would be possible to plot the locations of the stars and then await the sun to move into the field of view, whereupon waiting then the moon would pass in front of the sun, veiling it from our eyes, but darkening the skies enough for the astronomers to capture photographs of the stars behind. So there was an earlier opportunity to do this in 1914, but as you know, uh, the Great War broke out only several weeks afterwards, and poor Irwin Freundlich, who was from the Berlin Observatory, was actually captured by the Russian soldiers, and his equipment was impounded. And this was a very sad occurrence, because especially with my uh, disappointing view of how the, the Great War began. No. 
to me, war is like a disgrace to civilization. Uh, it should be done away with once and for all heroism it, to, at command. Uh, senseless brutality, deplorable, mindless love of country. These, how, how violently I hate this. But I digress. Needless to say, this is the reason why I turned my back on Germany because it was uh, the, the Prussian, the, even the schools were like uh, led by uh, military officers. But, and this is the reason why I changed my, uh, my citizenship. But I, I am digressing. Mercifully, back to the science. With the armistice of 1918, not only ended the war, but it provided a new opportunity to make this test. And it was very appropriate that this would be done with the help of another astronomer in England named Arthur Eddington, who was at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. Now, notably a Quaker, by the way, and a pacifist like myself. Now, this would be very appropriate because a German was being aided by a Briton. And this would transcend nationalism and raise science to its proper pedestal. Now, it was a very hopeful gesture, but yes, it was a very daunting enterprise as well. Now, Eddington convinced his superiors that the British should mount an expedition, and one was set in for the spring of 1919. There was uh, half of the expedition was sent to the coast of Brazil in a small town in Sopal, and across the southern Atlantic Ocean on the west coast of Africa on a very tiny island named Principe. Their hope was that they would catch the shadow of the moon as the path of totality passed across the ocean and they would have added photographic evidence of this, uh, of this event. And just days prior to this, uh, they took pictures of the stars in the Hyades cluster, which is near Taurus, I believe, and the true positions of the stars were noted. Then, amidst great tension due to the devilish weather, the eclipse occurred on May 29th, and a series of photographs were taken for the totality of the eclipse, which was a mere six minutes and 50 seconds. Now, it took six months to analyze the data uh, from the scientific community, but eventually, while I was traveling on a trip, I re received a telegram from Henrik Lorenz, and to give me this glorious news that it was announced in London in November, that the photographic plates showed a shift in the position of the stars equivalent to 1.7 seconds of arc, a distance that would be the equivalent to holding a, a coin at two kilometers away. So a very small change, but a very large significance because Newton could not explain this. You became a worldwide celebrity professor. Uh, the newspapers, uh, I have a couple of headlines that I'd like to read to you from the newspapers at the time. Lights all askew in the heavens. Men of science more or less agog over results of eclipse observations. Einstein's theory triumphs. Or revolution in science, new theory of the universe, Newtonian ideas overthrown. You got to meet quite a few people, including the president at the time, uh, Harding. You even met Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> yes. I felt like a pagan idol. The newspapers, the photographers, I recall that there was a moment when you, uh, your motion pictures from Charlie Chaplin, and I was cheered at the opening of his uh, film premiere in Los Angeles. And he said that the thousands of throngs of people cheer for him because everyone understands him and they cheer for me because no one understands me. <laughs> Nonetheless, I have become more and more stupid with fame, which is a common phenomenon. I even at one time penned a little poem for the occasion. <laughs> Would you like to hear it? Yes. Yes, please go. Please say it. Wherever I go and wherever I stay, there is always a picture of me on display. On the top of a desk or out in the hall, tied around the neck or hung on a wall. Women and men, they play a strange game, asking, beseeching, please tell me your name. From the erudite fellow, they brook not a quibble, but firmly insist on a piece of his scribble. Sometimes surrounded by all this good cheer, 
I'm puzzled by some of the things that I hear and wonder my mind for a moment not hazy if I and not they are the ones that are crazy. <laughs> it is true. I recall the insane asylum across the street from where we lived in Prague. And I was thinking that the only difference between the madman there and myself was that those were the lunatics who did not study physics and I was the madman who did. <laughs> what would you have done if the English expedition had failed? Well, I would feel sorry for the dear Lord because the theory was beautiful. Perhaps this was presumptuous of me. Niels Bohr once jokingly said that Einstein, stop telling God what to do. <laughs> it might be the fact that now to punish me for my contempt of, society, of authority, that fate has made me the authority. <laughs> Delka irony. Set aside, even after Eddington's affirmation, there were still doubters. Before I left Germany, I was criticized viciously by conservatives in a book that was called 100 Authors Against Einstein. <laughs> to that I said, buy 100 authors. If I were wrong, one would have sufficed. <laughs> oh, the Germans have always had the tendency to be slavishly servient to psychopaths, but they had never been so accomplished at this as they had in the 1930s. And when my picture appeared in a Nazi magazine with the caption, not yet hanged. This was con confirmation that I would leave Germany and never return. And this is how I ended up in America. In October of 1933, I settled in the charming town of Princeton, New Jersey, and accepted a position at the Institute for Advanced Studies there. It was a haven for scholars and scientists so where we may regard the mysteries and phenomena of the world without being carried off by the maelstrom of the immediate. <laughs> it was though it was a pipe yet to be smoked. Now, I came to America because I had heard of the great freedoms that I had heard existed in this country. But between you and I and other like-minded intelligent people, I will share that there have been times when I thought that they had made a mistake in selecting America as a land of freedom at times. So it was not something that I could correct in the balance of my lifetime. So later I would become a kind of enfant terrible, as the French say, in my homeland, due to the fact that I was unable to keep my silence and swallow everything that was happening, such as the works of Mr. McCarthy. No, but the devilish topic of politics is for another time, yes? Now, I shall steer clear of the boisterous ocean of political passions, and like your countryman Thomas Jefferson, he once said, nature intended me for the tranquil pursuits of science by rendering them my supreme delight. So this was my preoccupation in the quiet little house on Mercer Street. No, alas, it was not always quiet. The doorbell would be ringing all the time. The mailman would be delivering letters. One common visitor was a little girl named Adelaide who would knock on my door and she was asking me for help with her multiplication tables. So, of course, she would come to Mr. Einstein and I assured her that she should not worry about her problems with mathematics because mine were much greater. Yet, I happily helped Addy with my homework on several occasions in exchange for a plate of homemade fudge. You see, I am still a child at heart. So, I have spoken enough, but let me offer a bit of advice. Do not grow old, no matter how long you live. Never cease to stand like curious children before the great mysteries into which we were born. Thank you, Professor Einstein. I Thank think you. I think can I open it up to questions. I hope you're prepared for whatever anybody has to offer you. I hope I am prepared as well. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to, uh, again, this is a new way of doing things, so I'm a little, uh, going to be a little slow on this. Right now, uh, can people raise their hands if you have a question? 
Uh, and I'm not seeing everybody in the gallery, so. I have put them all asleep, okay. perhaps. Okay, Jamie has a question, so I'm gonna unmute Jamie. Jamie, go ahead and ask your questions to Professor Einstein. I would just like to know what you think uh, Albert Mendel Meckel Meckelson, uh, why wouldn't he accept the failure of his experiment of the luminiferous ether? It is, it is a testament to the fact that the status quo is a very strong impetus. That it was just impossible for this gentleman to believe that the explanation of his failed experiment to determine the ether drift could only be explained by upsetting very fundamental parameters of our understanding of the universe. Uh, if most people would be asked that, well, to understand Dr. Einstein, all that you have to do is determine that uh, a meter is no longer a meter or a second is no longer a second, or a kilogram is no longer a kilogram. You can understand why many people, including great minds like Mr. Michelson, found this very hard to, to accept. But at the, at the end of his life, and thanks to my undying gratitude, uh, gratitude uh, for providing me the impetus for starting the, the special theory of relativity, relativity, he actually realized that his uh, contribution was there, even though his mindset was yet to catch up at the time. Okay, is there another question out there? And I'm keeping my eye on everybody. I'm sure there's a couple of people who had some questions. Let's go with John uh, oh, Scott, as his hand raised. Uh, Scott Cunningham, I'm gonna recognize you. Uh, whoops, sorry about that. Go ahead and ask your question. Scott Cunningham. Uh, you've got, you've turned your microphone off. <laughs> okay, okay, can you, okay. Go so ahead. we love the picture of you playing the piano and wondered what importance was music in your creative genius and how did it work? It was indispensable. We spoke as about the fact that uh, there are tumultuous things that can occupy your mind, such as politics and the like and fame and, and, and fortune and these things. The, the only things that calmed me in the storm was being able to walk across the room and take up my violin. <laughs> my wife said on several occasions that if it were not for the device, I would not be able to do science. So music, and I think this is probably the case, it was with many people of science, that there is a mathematical elegance to music, uh, the structures that are there, uh, the seeming, seeming a random noise that an instrument could make is woven into a, a lovely symphony of, of uh, understanding, of a, a way of expressing ourselves uh, uh, creatively. And how is that different than filling an equation, uh, a board with equations? I, I think it is no different. So uh, my love for uh, Euclid is matched by my love for Mozart. <laughs> Okay, let's have John Drabeck next. John, let's see, I'm gonna unmute you. I'm trying. I think that will work, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, John. Good. Uh, Professor Einstein, I wonder if you could um, comment on the recent, uh, recent discovery of gravitational waves caused by the collision of black holes and how uh, that relates to your uh, general relativity theories. No. Could you perhaps repeat the events that you had just said? Gravitational waves have been discovered? This is marvelous. Yes, they have. <laughs> um, and, it, and they were able to align them to the collision of two black holes. The black um, holes, you mean a, a completely gravitationally collapsed star, yes? Correct, yes. <laughs> uh, something that had fallen within the Schwarzschild uh, radius. Well, uh, oh yeah, Swatchard, yes, uh, it, it, I, I recognize his work. But you, you understand that originally I thought black holes, although they were acceptable for the mathematics of the general theory of relativity. And in fact, even in Newtonian uh, gravitation, the idea of something with an escape velocity higher 
than the speed of light was conceivable. Uh, a scientist named Mitchell, I believe, was the man who first proposed these dark stars, but I thought they were rather too exotic to actually exist and did not trouble my mind with these fanciful thoughts, but apparently they have been discovered. And so when they collide, I guess this provides a sort of uh, turbulence in the space-time continuum that is actually travels through space at the speed of light. And this has been detected with some sort of instrument. So I'm curious as to what sort of instrument was used to, to, to make this monumental discovery. Um, I, I will summarize it by saying a very, very expensive one. <laughs> <laughs> it always seems that that is the case, yes? And to think that Isaac Newton used a mere prism and an apple to do uh, 300 years worth of science, and now we have a million dollars machines that are doing it for us. But nonetheless, I am delighted that this was uh, yet another uh, confirmation of the general theory of relativity. It was, uh, we thought we were doing quite well by just bending light around a star, but now with the advent of gravitational waves, uh, this uh, probably allows for an entirely new form of astronomy at some particular time. Light was the only tools that we had in 1919, and now you can perhaps have telescopes that use gravitational waves as their media by which you analyze things. This is truly really fascinating. Let's see if, if there's another question out there. I'm looking around. I'm sure Roger, ah, Roger's waving his hand. Let me see. I'm trying to unmute you. It won't, uh, I'm trying to unmute you. There you go, Roger, go ahead. Like, okay, I'll pose two questions. I've heard uh, a friend of mine say that they heard you quote, that God don't, doesn't roll the dice, if you could explain that. And secondly, do you consider any of your, uh, the uh, theories that you postulated to be a blunder? Oh, well, so there are, there are many blunders. We'll save that for the second part, but um, there are some who think that I, I blundered uh, when I uttered the phrase uh, that God does not roll dice, because as you know, this is uh, in reference to my, my disdain, as is such a strong word, but disagreement with Niels Bohr over the notion of quantum mechanics. I just do not believe that the creator would leave such things to chance. And I understand that it is a very powerful tool and there is great success. Uh, you can ask Niels Bohr and I have had many an argument over this, uh, sometimes heated and sometimes friendly, more friendly than heated. But nonetheless, when I told him, <laughs> we, we already said that, that uh, I think it was in response to uh, God does not roll dice that, uh, I'm, that uh, Bohr said to me, uh, <laughs> stop telling God what to do. Now, uh, regarding the second part of your question, uh, there have been mistakes, yes. I recall that perhaps one that is particularly germane to, to uh, astronomers was uh, the inclusion of uh, the gravitational constant uh, in, in the theory of general, uh, in the general theory of relativity, because this uh, was uh, instituted so as to keep the universe in a static state and as you know, throughout the 1900s, uh, 10s and 20s, uh, this was being investigated uh, to the highest degree in, in America, in, in, in California and in Arizona between uh, competing uh, uh, astronomers. And it was eventually found that the universe is indeed expanding. And my, my, my supposition, my inclusion of this constant was, was incorrect. And I had to correct for this, uh, thanks to the work of, of the great uh, Hubble, uh, when he proposed that the, the light from the distant stars is shifted in its spectra to prove that the, honor, the universe is expanding. And uh, it turns out that uh, Mr. I, the astronomer's name escapes me, uh, Heber Curtis, yes that he was correct and Hollow Shapley was, uh, was incorrect. It's the universe is far greater in size and growing at every instant at amazing speeds. So yes, but I think any scientists should be happy to be proven wrong because you know what that means? That there are still things yet to be discovered. So uh, 
I, I wear that mistake uh, as a badge of honor. Uh, Rich Tenney, I'm going to recognize you. Uh, go ahead, Rich. Ask your question. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, I'm, because we're in the 21st century, um, women are seen as equals in society nowadays. And I'm wondering if you can comment on the role that your first wife, Mileva Marek, had in influencing your work and how much credit we need to give her for some of the things that um, you've been given, given credit for. Well, this is, is uh, warming to my heart to think that if poor Mileva was born in, in your time, that uh, she would be able to rise to the heights of, of, of scientific achievements. So they, uh, and it appears that there are many of women in the audience who are, who are uh, steeped in, in scientific enterprise. And unfortunately, uh, just as though uh, Marie Curie had the same problems, that there was great prejudices uh, against women uh, learning the sciences. It, it was certainly a, a gentleman's world uh, and not so gentlemanly at particular times. So. Uh, Mileva and I, at the early days, uh, they were heady and wonderful times where we fed on each other's energy to explore the wonders of physics. Uh, I hear when you see romantic uh, motion pictures and they talk about this or that and poetry and the flowers, <laughs> Mileva and I would talk about uh, Maxwell's equations and such as we uh, sipped our coffee in the cafe. So her contributions to my early work uh, were indeed uh, significant. And I can only lament the fact that um, the, the nature of life at that time was such that it was difficult for women to, to leap over the many uh, obstacles that were placed in their way. And this is perhaps the reason why her dreams were never realized. Uh, can we have another question? Let's take Joe Joseph Cunningham. He's got his hand raised. Uh, Joe, so, oh, I see down there. Okay, just uh, go ahead, Joe. So, first of all, thank you so much for uh, letting me participate. This has been really great, Professor Einstein. I've, I've enjoyed listening to your uh, accounts of your work and your, your stories. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of a couple of questions came to mind. Um, first of all, the the idea that light follows a curvature. Uh, through space-time is a little bit dif difficult to wrap my mind again around as typically we think of light refracting through a transparent substance or object and due to our ability to see the stars we know that space the emptiness out there is is transparent so is, is there another way to describe why light follows a curvature but it is actually perhaps we, we, we spoke of the relationship between acceleration and gravitation and how they seem similar to each other. So perhaps if you were to uh, take uh, the spaceship or the elevator in space, it's a, the, the astronaut found himself, and if there were two windows on both sides and if a beam of light came in, it would go straight across and out the other window, yes? Now, seemingly straight as we understand light to normally behave, but if this room or this chamber he was in was moving upward, even at a constant velocity, the light as it traverses, as it moves forward, will land across the other side an immeasurably small amount of distance because light travels so fast. Now, he would have to go very quickly. Now, if he were to accelerate, that light beam would seem to follow the curvature of any projectiles that you would understand. When you throw a ball from the window, it travels in a parabola, so the beam of light to the observer inside of this container would see the light moving from here, and if he could watch it, it would land over here in a curve. Now, again, it is a matter of, uh, how should we say, perspectives. Isn't uh, the aspects of the general theory of relativity, it doesn't matter. You cannot think of the light as, as bending this in some space. It is space that is warping itself, and all of our understandings that we base, the way we look at the world of movements and uh, accelerations and velocities and the like, they are suspect. Time itself is suspect, is, the, uh, is, is, is perhaps the best way to say this. So um, 
I'm sorry if I cannot make it sound simpler than that, but remember it took me, I think, what, 16 years before I could actually put these ideas together. <laughs> Thank you. That that does that does help with the visualization. My my second question uh, is kind of along the same lines. We know that due to your, uh, if we follow your theories, space itself is affected by mass. Uh, in your opinion, then, is space itself made up of some type of particle that reacts to a massive force? Yeah, this is the eternal question, and perhaps I should ask you in the twenty first century if this has been figured out yet. So not yet. <laughs> the notion of what mass is, is something that eluded me uh, throughout my entire scientific career. Uh, it was something that would have to be discovered for the ages. Now, there were uh, some scientists who, uh, I, I remember there was a young man named Feynman who worked in, in, in New Mexico at the Los Alamos project who had projected some notions of how the mass would interact by a stream or some sort of particles and, and the like. But this was uh, at a time in my career when uh, my mind was a, a little bit of cobwebs had formed. So it was uh, a question for, for future generations. So it sounds as though the mystery of mass remains a mystery. Thank you. Uh, Rich Tenney, you were hoping up, holding up a book can, do you have something to say or comment about it? No, I just had this book here from Professor Feynman that you mentioned, uh, The Pleasure of Finding Things Out. Oh. That sounds like a very appropriate title for a book. Yes. <laughs> okay, are there other questions? I'm still looking for them. Uh, I have one, oh, I, I see one coming from Eric and Ann. Okay, I just... I'm hitting the unmute button, it's not unmuting. There you go, go ahead, Eric. So I've been struggling for many, many years with the idea of light being both a wave and a particle. And uh, so I would like to get your explanation or your take on this dual behavior of light in maybe a way that might help me better understand how light can both be a wave and a particle. Uh, you understand when, when you are a child and you would be asking a question and uh, you would say, uh, Father, why does a giraffe have a long neck? And he would say, because it's a giraffe and it has a long neck. So <laughs> perhaps, perhaps the best way to understand and explain this nature of light is to say that light is light. It is not a particle. It is not a wave. It is light and it behaves somewhat in both ways. And this was the interest of scientists for 200 years. Remember, so it's there were, uh, Einz, uh, Newton himself <laughs> thought that uh, life was a particle uh, of corpuscular nature. It wasn't until the work of Huygens when it became more wave-like in its understanding. And the notion was, if you can simply apply the tools to understand it, it doesn't necessarily mean that if a hammer works well for hammering in a nail, it doesn't, the nail doesn't care what it was used to drive it into the wood, it just driven into the wood. So light was explained by the tools that we had at, at hand. And thanks to the work of Descartes and, and, and Newton and the like, uh, Galileo even, we understood how particles interacted with each other on a large scale. And thanks to the work of Huygens and Thomas Young, and eventually Maxwell, uh, we understood that there was also another tool in the world of electromagnetism that would yield understanding of light. And eventually, once it was settled, I believe it was 1907 or 1807, when uh, Thomas Young did his famous uh, interference experiment, uh, essentially the, the the argument was settled for, for, for many hundred years, and then I came along and explained uh, the photoelectric effect, which reintroduced this notion of a particulate explanation of energy. And this, of course, led directly to the work of, of Max Planck and his quanta. So it is not so much that light needs to be anything. A draft does not need to be a dog. It does not need to be a horse. It's a draft. So perhaps, we just should understand light the way a child would. Light is light. 
Okay, Ken, is there another question out there? Um, I, I have two screens to look at, so I'm, I'm having to switch back and forth. I'm going to ask a quick question. I might be backtracking on this a little bit. But for us astronomers, we call it the Great Debate. It was a discussion between uh, Harlow Shapley and Herbert Curtis, Hubert Cur Herbert Curtis, uh, regarding the size of the universe. Uh, I believe that was about in the 1920s or something like that. Were you aware of that debate going on and whose side did you take? Uh, yes, we are very aware. It actually, uh, the debate was uh, in uh, 1922, I think, which was just after my first visit to the United States. I, in 1921, I didn't even speak English at the time uh, very well. But um, we were very aware of this because it was the new frontier. Uh, uh, the, the notion that uh, the universe was some sort of uh, contained space that was set in, in, in its dimensions uh, was being challenged by the work of astronomers. It was uh, the heyday of astronomy. Uh, the simple discovery of Fraunhofer with the notion of spectra opened all sorts of uh, wonderful opportunities. Uh, and uh, it, we, we spoke of the work of women, yes. There was the, the calculators in Harvard. Um, so Cecilia Payne was uh, a contributor to the study of spectroscopy. But all of these uh, things together gave the tools for astronomers to prove that, uh, that Mr. Shapley's understanding uh, that the Milky Way was the limit of the universe was uh, a vast understatement. And that uh, Heber Curtis, his notion that the Milky Way is nothing more than uh, an, an island. Uh, what was the word he used? Um, uh, island, island universes. Uh, actually, this was... Uh, uh, in old terms, it was used by Immanuel Kant, a German uh, philosopher, some years earlier, uh, when he proposed that perhaps uh, Andromeda was another Milky Way. So there was always suspicions that this might be the case, but as the science became better, the proof had to become better. And it wasn't until you had um, uh, Mr. Hubble's work uh, and Milton Homerson, his assistant, that these, uh, that these things were proven. And I had to uh, readjust my understanding that the universe is not static, it is expanding. So the great debate was a great debate and I don't know if anyone won in particular because Mr. Curtis was not fully uh, correct in his assumptions, but I can say that uh, astronomy won the, won the debate because it uh, opens up an entirely new aspect of our understanding. Thank you. Uh, this is a very unique opportunity. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any potential questions, please by all means ask. Uh, raise your hands or hit the little uh, uh, raise your hand button. Uh, Luke will tell you about that. Uh, Nate Goodman has a, a question. He's waving. Okay, Nate, I'm trying to unmute you. I don't know why it's... I'm clicking. Uh, Nate, you're not, uh, I, can you unmute at your own, uh, on your own? Now can you hear me? Go ahead, can Nate. You, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, I, I want to ask the professor, are there stars that are motionless at the center of our galaxy that do not move? But... I would say that there probably is not, because even if you look at the understanding of our solar system, which was considered to be the, the entire universe for hundreds of years, yes, that uh, everything was after the advent of Copernicus, of course, that uh, all the planets revolved around the sun. But thanks to the work of Newton, it was realized that due to uh, his uh, action and reaction that if the planets are attracted by the sun, the sun must be attracted by the planets, so they must pull on each other. And then we realize that the sun actually moves in a small amount as the planets pull on it, the way a man who is dancing with a lady at a ball is wobbling around, that's why he, has, he's, he transfer around himself. So it is my understanding that 
part, nothing is essentially still in this universe. Everything is in motion. That is a, a fundamental precept of relativity. It's the only one thing that one can say is, I am moving at a constant velocity or I am accelerating. There is no still. Thank you for your answer. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, anybody else with a question? I just wanted to say thank you uh, for letting me attend. I need to, to butt out for another appointment, but thank you for your time, Professor Einstein, and, and the rest of you for, for letting me pop in. It was, a, it was a great experience, and I appreciate it. Nice meeting you, Joseph. Thank, thank you. you. Good night. night. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if nobody else has any questions and I'm looking for it, I have to go between two screens, so I'm not sure. Okay, uh, Professor Einstein, do you have any questions for us here in the 21st century? Well, I, I would very much like to know if there have been any further proofs of the theory of relativity that are all of the things we are speaking about seems to be so otherworldly and happening millions of light years away. Perhaps there are some, some uh, attributes of relativity that have become into common usage that uh, improves the life of everyday people. Rich Tenney, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, oh, there have been... Can you hear me okay now? Yes. Yeah, there, there have actually been several... Um, ways that your theories have been uh, demonstrated. Uh, we live in an age now where we have um, high energy lasers. Uh, we, we've refined the tool set tremendously since you were alive um, in, in the way we can measure things and so forth. But um, in, in multiple ways, we've um, affirmed that the speed of light uh, is in a vacuum is constant, and depending on what is that? <laughs> yeah, um, the the uh, in in two thousand nine, NASA's Fermi Gamma Ray Telescope detected two photons uh, virtually the same moment. One of them was carrying a, a lot more energy than the other one was, uh, but they they were determined to be and measured to be essentially traveling at the same speed. Um, <sighs> we have with our most powerful telescopes detected um, gravitational lensing, um, both in a strong sense uh, where uh, a, a, a very dense galaxy um, will cause multiple images of a, of a large galaxy behind it to be um, lensed around it. I'm not, probably not doing a very good job of explaining no, that. This makes perfect sense. If there is a curvature, an immense curvature around something that is very massive, the light would, instead of going off on its straight lines, would be bent around, and thus you would have a, center, a sort of dual image, perhaps. I could see a, a situation where there would be a bright star in the center, and maybe there would be two similar stars here or here, and that they would actually be the same star. Yeah. making some sort of cross in the sky, which would be uh, very intriguing. So this gravitational lensing is completely uh, appropriate for the general theory of relativity. So I, I, I am yet again uh, very pleased. And you mentioned very briefly that there are apparently uh, gamma ray telescopes now. This is yes. a wonderful. You glossed over this rather quickly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so both with strong lensing, weak lensing, and we're... we're uh, looking into dark matter and dark energy and trying to understand those. And we think that weak lensing is also going to play an important role in that. We also have uh, observed uh, the phenomenon of micro lensing where, you, uh, where we have been able to detect um, extrasolar planets um, by seeing how a background star's brightness in this lensing pro process can have a little bump in it when when it's got a, a planet that is orbiting that and so these planets are actually detected by perhaps transiting the yes. surface of the sun and changes in the light is is detected yes oh this is we have, very exciting. Uh, we have oh. the space telescope space-based telescopes now that are strong enough to do that um 
with black holes, we have taken the first picture last year of an actual black hole. And um, it is black, you know. That would be very difficult. <laughs> well, we can see the energy around it, um, and it follows the the uh, you know the general theory of relativity about how gravity gravity behaves in those. Uh, we have an X-ray observatory, the Chandra X-ray observatory, that has been helping with that, and. Um, We've also got a nuclear spectroscopic telescope array, um, et cetera. So NASA's got some tremendous tools that are helping with that. We've observed relativistic jets from um, the distant galaxy M87, uh, imaged in infrared light, uh, where we can see jets of extremely hot gas being ejected from that. and. Um, like a beacon across the light years, yes? Yes. And uh, its enhanced brightness is due to the emission of light from particles traveling towards the observer at near speed of light, um, an effect that we call relativistic beaming. Um, this is truly marvelous. I will admit, to, to, to quote um, Mr. Eddington, a phrase that he would say when things were going bad, he would say, I am rightly chuffed. So this means he was very proud. So. You have made me very proud to hear that these, uh, these developments uh, have been uh, the children of the, the parent that was the general theory of relativity. So this is, uh, this is wonderful news. And the notion that is there has been uh, an image captured of, of the dark star, the black hole, so to speak, uh, it boggles one's mind. It's like, as I said before, the most wonderful thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible at all. <laughs> We've, we've also observed um, this a phenomenon called gravitational vortex, uh, where um, in the case of black holes, the gravity is so intense that it makes infalling material wobble around it. You think of it like a spoon stirring honey, where honey is the space around the black hole. And this, in fact, uh, has been used uh, by scientists using the European Space Agency's XM M. Newton uh, Nuclear Spectroscopic Telescope Array. Uh, the behavior. Europeans, the behavior. Europeans have a space agency now. Yes, oh, and um, <laughs> and the uh, the odd uh, orbital motions of Mercury that you uh, were uh, interested in trying to figure out uh, falls into this same category of this gravitational vortex as it's is uh, near the sun. I, I, I can feel the steely eyes of Sir Isaac Newton looking in the back of my head. I feel the heat from them. I think he would be angry with uh, all of these discoveries. He was a very jealous man, they say. <laughs> um, an hour before this, this uh, particular podcast started, uh, or this, this event started tonight, where we're talking to you, um, the folks at the... Um, U of U, we're also doing a um, podcast about uh, a uh, series of observatories that we've established called LIGO that also detect gravitation, that have been able to detect gravitational waves and talking about that. Uh, it's tremendous, uh, complex uh, instruments using uh, advanced lasers and extreme Extremely sensitive detectors. And, what is, what's and this acronym, LIGO? Uh, what does this mean, these letters? Laser inter, Interferometer oh, Gravitational interferometer. Wave Observatories. Oh, Some, something like that, yeah. You know, there was, uh, this was the, similar to the instruments that Michael and, Michelson and Morley used uh, when they did the experiment in Case Western University in, uh, is it Ohio, I believe? So it's, uh, they used an interferometer to try to detect the ether drift. So apparently the notion of using uh, waves to, de to detect motion uh, is still being used to great effect now to detect gravitational waves. So this is all the more exciting. Yes, and they've, they've also been able to determine that gravitational waves, as you also theorized, uh, move at the same speed as light does. So well, that's, that seems to be the, the speed limit in the universe. Indeed it was. Um, and this, we've also, I, we, 
Oh, sorry. Go but ahead. The, the notion that electricity and, and energy and light all travel have this uh, special speed. I uh, we owe this to to Maxwell's equation. So I was merely using his tools, and, and now someone is using mine. So it is uh, it is uh, it is quite humbling. In the in the twentieth twentieth and twenty first century, we've also sent uh, numerous spacecraft out to explore our solar system, and in the process <laughs> of communicating with these spacecraft relative to the sun and so forth, we've also observed that um, radio waves are um, delayed um, by their proximity to the sun. So we know that uh, the sun's gravity is having an impact on how those radio signals are uh, sent. When you have multiple spacecraft, we can, we can make those calculations determination as well. Which is, you, you mentioned that there is the ability now to have a uh, spacecraft and you know this was predicted by uh, Newton in the 1680s that this would someday be possible but it makes me wonder because there was one aspect of general relativity that we did not speak about was that if uh, space and time are inextricably connected then if you warp space you should perhaps warp time and so Perhaps this is something that could be analyzed now that there are spaceships that are high above the, the gravitational influence of the Earth, that perhaps they would sense gravity as being different by a dilation in the time. So is, has this come to pass? Yes. Uh, thank, thank you, Rich. I would add just one more thing uh, for Professor Einstein to I uh, hopefully appreciate. Your adopted country, the United States of America, put men on the moon in 1969. Oh, God in heaven, this is wonderful news. <laughs> I should travel in time more often. There are all sorts of wonderful things. <laughs> now, one thing I will advise you, Professor, is even though we have been giving you some information about what happened in the 21st century, you're not allowed to talk about it to anybody else. You would be perceived as clairvoyant, and that yes. might not go over well. You wouldn't have that happen. Yes, we remember what happened to the things like uh, the witches in Salem. So we want what you don't want to look too smart. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Looks Do like John's got his hand raised. Let's. Oh, who's got his hand raised? John. Sorry, John, I muted you right I, after you I unmuted. Got it. I got yeah, it. Okay. Go ahead, John. John, go ahead. Okay. Uh, can you hear me what? now? No. Uh, are you on? Yeah, go ahead, John. <laughs> I keep hitting the button. I think. Two people are hitting the button. I, oh. Yes, multiple people are hitting the button. Okay. Luke, hit the button. Make a turn. <laughs> okay, I, I, I believe I'm in. Is that correct? Okay, Can you hear me? Go for it. Okay. So, uh, Professor, there's one other that, um, that uh, millions of people use every day. We've talked about some that are of interest to the, the thousands or tens of thousands of astronomers around the world, but there's another. Uh, because of the ability to launch spacecraft, one of the things that has been done is a constellation of satellites has, has been put in place around the Earth, and they provide extremely accurate time signals uh, that can then be used to coordinate your position on the Earth. It's called the Global Positioning System, and through this constellation of satellites, you can now hold in your hand a device that can tell you where you're at anywhere on the surface of the Earth, mountaintop to sea level uh, with an accuracy of less than one meter. And uh, one of the reasons that that's possible is because the transit of those satellites has to be relativistically corrected. Even though they're only traveling at, uh, well, if you take all the speed factors into account, they're probably traveling at about 30,000 uh, kilometers per hour, not ex exceptionally fast, but this but is enough, enough because a, get... a small fractional change in the in the time, and I, I would assume that this could make the difference between being tens of kilometers off from where you would predict if this were not corrected for. 
that's correct. So now we can we can tell where you're at uh, just with a device that you hold in your hand. It's your cell phone, which uh, I'm on, I'm I'm forced to say relies heavily on quantum effects. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's give let's give Dr. Bohr his due. He was a, a brilliant man, so I can certainly share the stage there. But it is wonderful to think that you live in a time when no one can get lost again. <laughs> think of all of the people who have been lost and now this does not happen anymore? It is well, not. there are still a number of people who exhibit the symptoms of being lost on a regular basis, Professor. <laughs> yeah, some things never change, yes? So there are two things that are in the world that are infinite, uh, gravity and the stupidity of mankind. But perhaps that is not a very nice thing to say at the end of our evening. <laughs> Tiger, well, thank you for, uh, for your okay. discussion tonight. It has been... Um, just a, a great experience, and uh, we look uh, forward to calling you back into our version of space and time sometime in the near future. It has been my very great pleasure, and my cat Tiger says he has enjoyed it as well. It is time to go, and sometimes he wants to be in, and sometimes he wants to be out. Sometimes both. Perhaps I should have named him Schrodinger. But <laughs> anyway. It has been my very great pleasure to spend the evening with such erudite uh, Congress of Astronomers. And uh, I, I wish you all the best in your uh, advancement of studies and continue to educate others uh, of the wonders that occur in the heavens because it is something that is been at the center of, of scientific enterprise since the dawn of man. So you are, you are doing a very valuable service to society and future generations. And someday you will be invited backwards across the centuries. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Einstein, for all of your time this evening. I want to say to everybody else who has attended tonight, I hope you've had an enjoyable evening. Uh, with the current health situation, I would suggest you keep safe. And I wish you all the clearest of skies. And we're going to bring this meeting to a close. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Good night.